that we are going live. <clears throat> so if you want to just retweet, and then people might be able to join us in the uh, in the chat room. That would be great. Yeah. And I'm going to put it on Facebook, too. And let's see if we have any viewers here. We are live. I don't see any viewers yet, but uh, sometimes it takes a little while for the viewers to show up. And uh, hopefully we will get this all set up. Uh, mm -hmm. Great. So how is everything? There's a powerful thunderstorm going on in the Pacific Northwest. I hope you're okay. Yeah, no, it looks, it, everything's fine, but we just had a few little like glitches in our Wi-Fi and it seemed better to come to campus. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you made it remarkably fast, so I salute you for that. That's, uh, that's fantastic. Uh, yep. <laughs> great. Uh, so let me get, see, we got some viewers coming in, trickling in. Hello, everybody out there. Uh, it's such Hello. a treat to have uh, Emily Levesque here. I've been practicing your name for the last month, Emily. It's <laughs> I, I want to say Levesque, but then again, I always like to say Epitome and, uh, and, and all sorts of other uh, neologisms, as they say. Uh, how are you doing today <laughs> otherwise, Emily? Doing well. How about you? Uh, pretty good, yeah. We, we have a couple of clouds in the sky, so it's not perfect Southern California weather. Uh, but uh, but we'll survive. You know, I actually miss the thunderstorms, but be careful. What, <laughs> be careful what you wish for. Is careful what you wish for. Yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry, I haven't had your your picture there. I'd rather have my audience look at you. So there you are. There's Professor Emily Levesque of the University of, of Washington Astronomy Department. I followed your career for a long time. And it's only because of Twitter that we met, uh, which is kind of silly because yeah. I actually have uh, my uh, my uh, editor at Norton for losing the Nobel Prize uh, was none other than your agent, I believe, which is Jeff Shreve. So, Jeff, if you're yes. out there, uh, thank you for not making the introduction to me and Emily. <laughs> I, I only asked him 100 times, but uh, but I had to go right to you. Jeff's been pretty busy these days with it's it's been quite a time in the publishing industry so <laughs> uh, yeah I imagine yeah for me I've called this pandemic podcasting because there's almost no way I'd be able to get great guests like you and others if there wasn't a a, pod, a pandemic going on so I'm really appreciative of your time and uh, so I have a bunch of questions uh, for you and I'm also going to take uh, questions from the audience but I want to get started with a poem and this poem I want to get your reaction to and it's called when I heard the learned astronomer by Walt ah, Whitman yes. okay here it mm -hmm. goes not, not too long I'll read it really quickly I speak I'm a New Yorker so I can speak pretty quickly when I heard the learned astronomer when the proofs the figures were ranged in columns before me when I was shown the charts and diagrams to add divide and measure them when I, sitting, heard the astronomer when he lectured with much applause in the lecture room, how soon, unaccountable, I became tired and sick, till rising and gliding out, I wandered off by myself in the mystical, moist night air, and from time to time, looked up in perfect silence at the stars. So romantic. Uh, besides the, you know, the male astronomer making him sick, uh, what do you, how do you react to this, uh, to this uh, very well-known poem, Emily? I've, I'm familiar with the poem. I have a bit of a bone to pick with Walt Whitman, and <laughs> part of it, he, he is, you know, a starting point. But I actually, it gets at one of the fundamental things that I wanted to address in The Last Stargazers, because there's this conception in science that by breaking something down into the nuts and bolts and the zeros and ones and the physics, that we lose the beauty of it and we lose the ability to appreciate it. And to me, I feel like nothing could be further from the truth. I, I love looking up at the stars and thinking, oh God, I know why Betelgeuse is red. I know why that nebula is sitting where it is. And I interviewed more than a hundred other astronomers for The Last Stargazers. And I think to a person, everybody still had that sense of wonder to some degree about what they were studying in the sky. Yeah. I mean, I, I tell a story in the book about a bunch of us looking through a telescope and looking through an eyepiece in a large telescope, which is rarer than you might think yeah. for professional astronomers. And we all sounded like eight year olds looking at Saturn for the first time. And these are people that have absolutely dug into the physics of the things we're looking at. We've probably cursed our laptops and computer code that have prevented us from, you know, working properly and understanding these things. And at the same time, we're just in love with what we see. So. 
I think Whitman missed the mark a little bit, I gotta say. <laughs> yeah, me too. I always feel like uh, it's so romantic to think about this in a, as a poet. And then I actually was uh, honored to teach a class with a Pulitzer Prize winning poet, friend of mine, Ray Armantrout. And she and I co-taught a class called Poetry for Physicists because it's my feeling, and I want to get your reaction to it as a communicator of science, that we scientists have an obligation that we should actually be forced uh, under penalty of law. No, we shouldn't be. For, we, we have enough <laughs> of that as uh, state university employees, the two of us. Um, but we should uh, take as much training or some amount of training, maybe not as much, but we should dedicate some attention to the teaching of our craft, of what we do, and of the wonders of what we discover, not only because the people pay us in their taxes, because it's almost a moral obligation, in my opinion, to share this wondrous material that we have, as you do so lovingly, tenderly in the book, uh, with the public. What say you about uh, the obligation of a scientist to, to almost be forced, not just because you have to put it in your grant, but that we have an obligation, a moral obligation, to teach to the public who are not experts in about the wonders of astronomy? I think it's a crucial part of what we do. And you hit on part of it, which is that people's, we're fortunate that people's tax dollars support a lot of our research. And I think there's something fair to say, you know, we want to show you what you're paying for and you want to, we want to show you what you're doing. I also like, to me, it's a big part of why I got into this. My absolute favorite thing to do is to get someone else excited about science and get someone else excited about astronomy and being able to just go up to somebody and say, did you know this? This is so cool is such a valuable part of what we do. And I think that being able to communicate to honestly, to communicate at all levels, to communicate to the public and even to communicate to each other is a key part of science. Um, a point that I make to a lot of my students when they get, um, I've had students in classrooms who are a little put off by writing and emphases on writing. And they kind of say, well, I became a scientist because I'm not super into writing. And the point I try to make is if Einstein couldn't have properly explained general relativity, nobody would have cared. It wouldn't have been revel It wouldn't have been, you know, regarded as this groundbreaking science because you have to be able to communicate it. And whether it's communicating to peers or the public or reporters or grant officers, it's the same basic thing. You have to be able to tell the story and you have to be able to explain why what you're doing matters. And in that explanation process, I think it's uh, critically important to really recognize that we are given this great gift, which is the uh, which is the source material that we have. I always say human beings are born with two refracting telescopes in the middle of our heads, and uh, we should make use of that. And it's not maybe a surprise that, that most people find astronomy the most kind of uh, appealing of all the sciences. I always joke, nobody looks up at the sky and says, I hate that Republican constellation over there, or that Democratic comet, <laughs> really annoying me. Uh, it's apolitical, it's sort of a safe space, but it's an intellectual space. And the, the question that I always you know encounter is, why aren't we doing a better job at communicating it? Uh, and I think writing books, as you've done, popular books, uh, goes a long way. And so I want to commend you for The Last Stargazers. We're going to spend a lot of time uh, today talking about that. I want people to put it in the uh, their questions for Emily uh, in, the, in the chat, and some are already tr uh, trickling in, and that's going to be great. Uh, first of all, I always judge books by their covers. Uh, I don't know about you. But <laughs> I always heard this uh, this argument. Oh, you know, don't judge a book by its cover. But then, as you know, they put a lot of effort, money, time into cover design, cover art. Yours is unique uh, in that uh, I haven't seen. It has this beautiful three dimensional. I'll take this apart. But you actually have two covers. You've got an inner cover and an outer cover, and both are so delicious and delightful. Tell us, how did you get the uh, idea for the title of the book, the subtitle of the book, and the cover design? Well, I'll start with the cover design because I unfortunately can't take a lot of credit for that. Um, that was down to the brilliant design and artists, um, the artistic team at Sourcebooks, which is my publisher. But I did get really excited when they showed me the cover because they sent me the mock-up and I had had like a sad little like PowerPoint slide mock-up of what I thought the cover was going to be. And I drew it the way most astronomy books are drawn. There's sort of a black background with stars and like a silhouette of someone looking up. And when they sent me the cover and it was almost black and white, I was 
surprised for half a second and then realized it's wonderful because it makes it stand out. And that comparison of the black and white sort of almost line drawing of a galaxy, and then when you peel off the jacket, that beautiful star field, actually I thought was brilliant regarding the book because it's a little pictorial representation of how astronomy's changed. That the front of the book almost looks like a photographic plate. So those black on white images that astronomers used to take using glass plates that were treated to react to light. And then that little window through into the star field and peeling off the cover gives you that, you know, riot of color image that we imagine when we think of a Hubble image today. And that also actually ties into where the title of the book came from, because I had some people sort of call me out and say, well, the title sounds depressing. And it's meant to be a little bit more of a challenge than something sad. Um, it's in part a reference to the way technology is changing astronomy. So the way that people did astronomy back when we used photographic plates is very different than the way you and I do it today. And the way that we do astronomy is different than the way our students are learning astronomy. So we used to literally be attached to the telescope in some cases, and now maybe we observe from a room next to a telescope or a remote operating room. Some telescopes don't need operators anymore at all. So. It's a really exciting time for science, but it's also removing astronomers from where we used to be in the observing process. And I wanted to write a book that saved those stories from when observing was really hands-on. And then the challenge of it is that people obviously do still stargaze. I hope someone looks at that title and says, wait, I stargaze, I like stargazing a lot, what do you mean? And people will stargaze for their jobs or for the pleasure of it. And I think that recognizing the kind of curiosity and enthusiasm behind why people stargaze is really valuable. So that was another sort of call out that I wanted to make in the title that the reasons behind stargazing really drive what we do, even though the way we do our work is very different these days. Yeah, it's a lyrical book. It's a it's sort of a, you know, kind of a poetic book in its in its way. And that title is suggestive of this a longingness, a longing for perhaps the darkness of the night sky in ancient time. I don't think anyone wants to go back and ride inside a telescope again, uh, as as you depict in the book, or, you know, possibly be threatened by gunshots from a irate graduate student in Texas. Uh, <laughs> but that really uh, rem reminds me that the book is mostly, it's kind of a a memoir it's sort of an adventure story and i want uh, i hate it when podcasters would ask me explain your entire book so that nobody has to read it and nobody buys it uh so uh, i want to take through some slides that we have that you provided maybe um uh you know you can sort of follow along with it but i, I wanted to start with kind of misconceptions about astronomy uh because <laughs> you've got a couple or misconceptions about science and how you got interested in science maybe you'll take us through that uh your childhood certainly you smashed the mold of the mit nerd you know i always joke how do you know someone went to mit well they that, and they're outgoing Going, well, they look at your shoes when they talk to you instead of their own. Uh, I've used that joke too many times to, to, to really uh, keep, keep using it in good faith. But talk us through your early childhood, how you, uh, young Emily, growing up outside of uh, Boston area, ended up going to MIT and, uh, and meeting friends such as uh, friends of the show like uh, Professor Frank Wilczek, who's coming on the show soon too, to talk about his new book, and, uh, and others. How did you get interested in astronomy? We cannot avoid that topic. So I really was interested in astronomy from the time that I was tiny. And in the slides, I think we have photographic evidence. Yes. That this yes. is true. Let me get um, to that. I'm going to share the screen on my yes. side. So I'll share that. But, yes. I'm, sh look, so I'm showing the side with contact right now. Just so you know. There you yes. are. There's a you um, with two uh, astronomers yep. looking through telescopes, apparently, with lab coats on, as we all wear. Um, Yes. So um, there's I'm not sure if um, viewers can see these slides because I can't see on Skype what we're seeing. Yeah. But there's a photo of me sporting a little Hubble Space Telescope T-shirt. I'm, I'm about six years old. Uh, my brother describes that facial expression as what do you mean six year olds can't use Hubble? Because um, I look like I'm just raring to get my hands on the telescope. But um, I really did get interested from a very young age, and I come from a family of people who are not professional scientists, but who are scientists by nature, who are very curious, who really encourage curiosity, and all of that really helps feed into sort of 
sparking that seed from very early on. So I tell the exact story of when I started to get interested in astronomy in the book, but it sort of stuck the whole time that I was growing up. Um, people would ask what I wanted to do, and I'd say, well, I want to be a ballerina or an astronomer, or I want to be a firefighter or an astronomer, or a violinist or an astronomer. And then when I got to college and got to MIT, I got the chance to start taking physics classes for the first time, which were exhaustingly hard. Um, Frank Wilczek was an amazing um, freshman mechanics professor. Um, that's quite a person to be learning sort of physics 101 from. But it was a trial by fire lesson in getting brought up to speed on physics. Um, and then I got to take my first observing class from the amazing Jim Elliott, who is just a legend in the field, I would learn later, um, for the incredible observing that he's done. But from him, I learned, you know, the first best practices of how to use a telescope. I learned that we put telescopes in the back of planes and then fly with them up into the stratosphere. Um, he took me out to Lowell Observatory in Flagstaff for the first time with the rest of the class, which is where I met collaborators that I still work with today. So it was a wonderful introduction through kind of the nuts and bolts of observing and the adventure of observing. Yeah. Um, we show some pictures of you, also uh, the the telescopes kit peak, and and then of course the movies that uh, feature heavily in your upbringing, at least the movie Contact, especially looming large. Another friend oh, yeah. of the show, Jill Tarter, uh, who's uh, who's an, an amazing astronomer and uh, and spans the wavelength range that you describe in the book. And I think you know one of the most interesting things about my book uh, about my book about your book is wishful thinking on my part you know that's the that's the highest praise you can give uh, i wish it was i wish i wrote your book um but uh, but you cover all sorts of uh, astronomical techniques technologies etc uh, observations that contact features with uh, Jody Foster playing our friend Jill Tarter all the way up through you know ultra high energy even all ultraviolet and beyond and neutrino telescopes uh, gravitational wave telescopes which are in the news almost all Ways. So I want to get your reaction, uh, since we are um, uh, kind of it's still in the afterglow of Nobel Prize annunciation season. What, uh, you know, how, how does how does the discovery of black holes and or at least the compact objects? They're very careful not to say that we've discovered black holes necessarily, but uh, compact objects as viewed by both the Event Horizon Telescope, which you talk about a little bit, but also Andrea Gez's work um, up the road from me in uh, in at the University of California. California, Los Angeles, what, uh, how they've impacted the study of gravitational waves in particular, as well as optical techniques, how they've influenced astronomy now with these modern techniques and tools. Yeah, it's it's a really fun question to pose because I was recently um, working on another project where I was sort of writing through the history of compact objects and black holes. And I always like tracing it back to Jocelyn Bell and the discovery of the first pulsar. So the first neutron star, these bizarre stars that are supported by principles of quantum physics. And those had sparked a lot of interest in black holes and compact objects in general. And then you had early observations of black holes that actually came through um, suborbital rocket observations. Um, people were launching x-ray detectors on rockets and picking up x-rays from a black hole that we now know, I believe, of. Cygnus X1 was one of the first ones that got picked up. So looking at the progression from those early discoveries through to gravitational wave observatories and the awesome research that won the Nobel Prize very recently, um, I'm sure everybody saw those animations of the um, the stars going around the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy, and I show those in class all the time. but. I like the idea of putting side by side the science and the amazing stuff that we found with studying black holes or studying the center of our galaxy or with the um, image that EHT got, and then putting that alongside the adventures that people had trying to do these observations. Um, I write in The Last Stargazers about rocket-based astronomy and how ridiculous it is to try and build this, you know, beautiful, perfect instrument and then just stick it on something and set it on fire. Like, really? Um, and then you look at the amazing image of a black hole from the EHT and hear about how hard the team members had to work to get that image and the months of observations and even something like shipping the data back from the South Pole to Cambridge was this like months long saga. And I like putting the two side by side because you get the fascinating science, but you get the sort of human faces and the human story alongside it. And like, maybe not everybody works on black holes, but everybody can understand the little quirks of a difficult work day. And hopefully that helps make it all seem a little more real and a little more present to 
readers. Absolutely. Yeah, it's so much fun to look at it. And actually, right now where I am is, uh, is a location, at least one of the uh, one of the, the uh, characters in your book, who's very much a real person, unfortunately, she passed away in April was Margaret Burbage, who is my late great mm -hmm. colleague at University of California, San Diego. And she actually helped to found the astronomy group that I'm sitting within right now. And I'm actually in her late husband, Jeff uh, Burbage's office right now. And uh, oh, I'm wow. honored to have his office. He was a, a real character. And it was funny because as you describe in the book, Margaret, who was one of the foremost astronomers of all time, she was not able to actually do her craft as she had been trained because of essentially sexism that prevailed back in the 60s and 70s. And it's so interesting that he would get time on the telescope at Mount Wilson, even though he was a theorist. and. I almost never let theorists into my laboratory, let alone near a telescope and sitting in the telescope to guide it. Actually, one time, according to Margaret, he almost died. He almost got crushed to death uh, inside of, I think it was the McDonald Observatory. But one of the treats I get is kind of mentioned in your book, which is uh, I find these photographic glass plates. This is one from 1971. This is before I was born. Excellent. Uh, and I find them. This is from Sarah Tololo. This is from a sensitometer, which I don't even know what that means. But um, And this is a test plate. But I'll find ones of, of galaxies. Behind my desk over here is an uh, image of <laughs> M82, I believe it is. Uh, which uh, yeah. it's jet shooting out uh, so famously. There it is. I'll put it there. It is. Uh, and uh, and I find all these other objects here. Of course, we had Margaret uh, um, a Burbage here, as well as Sally Ride, uh, Maria Geppert Mayer, who is also in the shot. There she goes. Um, so we've had a great tradition of astronomers, uh, especially female astronomers at UC San Diego. What's the status now of women in astronomy? How, is it getting better? You know, uh, and and it's refreshing to get your perspective. I think you give an honest appraisal you're not Pollyannish about it but you're also accurate about it we need to improve where is it uh, uh, where, what is the status of women in astronomy from your perspective as a professional astronomer I mean I've been it's funny to think about this because I think of myself as very fortunate in my career in that I've had very supportive colleagues I've had a lot of positive experiences in astronomy, but that shouldn't be fortunate. That should be the norm. Um, things have improved a great deal since Margaret Burbage what, had to um, observe as Jeff's assistant. Um, and I talk a little bit about sort of the math and statistics on this in the book. Um, in 2017, women earned 40% of astronomy PhDs. So there are certainly more women entering the field. And I think what we are now rightfully focusing on in the field is keeping women in the field, keeping women supported, recognizing amazing researchers like Andrea Ghez. Um, she was the first woman astronomer to win the Nobel Prize. And when you think about the many fantastic women who've done research that just completely changed and shaped the field, it's wonderful that she got this recognition. And it's also so sad that she was the first and not the 10th given how many people are doing this work. So the support to keep women in the field and to recognize their contributions are important. And there's a lot of other axes we need to consider because women got 40% of doctoral degrees awarded in 2017, but Hispanic women were 4%. African-American women were 2%. And being able to encourage more people to enter the field and then support them to stay and to want to be a part of this community is one, just the right thing to do as people. And it's really important for the science. Um, you described astronomy a little earlier as apolitical, and there's this nice feeling of looking up at the stars and not seeing a political affiliation when you look at a constellation. And I think that that would be the dream that you get to leave politics and human matters behind. But astronomy is done by people. And when there are political issues that are keeping people from being full participants and being able to really dig into and love this field, I think that it's an important part of the field to try and keep that at bay or to fix those problems and to listen to our colleagues who are telling us what they need to do the really amazing science that they're capable of doing. Mm. Yeah, that's a refreshing part of your book that you don't sugarcoat it. You don't say that you know everything is great now and we've made all these strides. Uh, we're moving in the in the right direction. There there are you know certainly a positive uh, first derivative, but but I think you know the future will will tell. Um, I also was very moved to uh, to both see 
the uh, renaming of the Vera Rubin uh, Teles- Observatory from the LSST. I didn't. I never thought that was a good name anyway. But uh, who better to name it for? So I wonder if you can talk about that. She was one of the also uh, stargazers who made their way through UC San Diego. And actually, she did some of her first rotation curve work with uh, with Margaret and Jeff Bur- Burbage's help, and actually credits them uh, for believing in her. And and of course, many of us were were deeply saddened by her passing without recognition that she so richly deserved. So um, so in terms of that, the Nancy uh, Rowan uh, Space Telescope that's going to be launched, um, the the progress seems to be uh, seems to be happening. But you're right, there needs to be more work. And um, I wonder, you know, from your perspective, I hate, you know, I asked Katie Mack this when she was on my pod, you know, how do we get more when girls and interested in science? And she said, you know, well, don't just give them pink circuit boards, you know, <laughs> uh, let's, <laughs> let's do something real, something tangible. Um, and so, uh, you know, you got exposed to it. And it seems to me that it could be done through almost anybody, um, you know, a parent with, with very li- little, re- you know, a few resources even. Um, the way that you got your exposure was with a tiny little telescope and interested parents. And, and I wonder, is that unique to you or your parents just exceptional or in, in that sense, your brother, <laughs> et cetera, uh, kind of wanting to outdo your brother, which is, I, I get that. I've got an older brother too. Um, oh, I still aspire to be like him. That's, you know, <laughs> that's what happens whenever you have a big sibling. Yeah. It's just, I mean, you're I'm just a, a professor family. at one of the best yeah. universities in the whole world. You know, you, you really, you're really a slacker, Emma, you know? <laughs> yeah. So go yeah, on. Sorry. Got it got to keep working on it. Um, But so I mean, my family was a wonderful aspect of this, but I don't, I hope that that doesn't make me too unusual. Um, I actually always get a kick out of this framing when people say, how do we get more girls interested in science? I didn't need any convincing to be interested in science. I don't think your average eight year old needs any convincing that black holes are cool. Whenever I give a presentation at a planetarium, all my questions are from eight year olds, Mm -hmm. any gender, and they're all about black holes. So we don't need to convince kids that science is interesting. We need to convince them to stay in it. And we need to convince them that it's something they can do, that they can see themselves in it as a career, that it's something they can pursue. So I never think of it as how to get girls interested in science. It's partly how to keep girls interested and how to make science a place for them. Um, so yeah, the pink, the pink circuit boards really won't do it. Um, I think it's just recognizing, you know, science is awesome and we need to kind of, in my mind, I'd like to see gender separated from what you can or can't do or how we need to treat you. Um, Mm -hmm. I think something nice that my family did for me as a whole is I was never once told, oh, it's so good that a girl is interested in science. And, oh, isn't it nice that you're a little girl that likes, you know, dolls and space? It was just like, yeah, you're a kid that likes space and you like dolls and you like running around in the backyard. And it was never something sort of specially presented because of my gender. So Mm -hmm. when I looked for role models, I didn't parse my role models by gender. I very much parsed them by, oh, look at somebody else who's as geekly interested in science as me. Um, Looking back, it was especially meaningful when I saw other nerdy girls like me who are, you know, featured as scientists or featured as people who did the sort of work I wanted to do. But I think that I didn't need to be talked into science. I needed to be talked into knowing that that was a place I could go and be and be happy. Yeah. In my opinion, uh, I I feel like it's uh, it's basically child abuse. If you don't get your kid a little $50 telescope and 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 put them outside, at least put uh, let let let, you know, him or her look up at the at the moon because you can see the exact same craters that Galileo saw on the moon. You can see the same phases of Venus and and the rings of Saturn and and the moons of Jupiter uh, that all. and, And it doesn't cost very much. And look, in your case, in my case, it led to a career in astronomy. Uh, and a very lucrative one at that, uh, I'm sure. I, I swear by binoc for what it's worth. I swear by binoculars yeah. as a tool. Yeah. And you can get those from anywhere because not everybody might have a backyard. Not everybody might have a dark sky to admire. But a pair of binoculars and just pointing them, even from like a city corner, yeah, up at the moon, is already fascinating. Yeah. Um, as as I interviewed people for the last stargazers, I never asked anybody why did you become right. an astronomer because I wasn't looking at origin stories. I wanted to hear about like their adventures once they were in the field. Almost everybody told me anyway because they were all observing stories. And it was, oh, I got to go camping with my family when I was little and I got to see a dark sky. Or I grew up in the city. I never saw stars. And then I went to a planetarium show and my mind was just blown. But it was always some moment of seeing the sky and just going like, wow. So the more 
more you can give people that chance to kind of get hooked, I think the better it is. And not see those darn learned astronomers get them out of here. Uh, they'll make the kids <laughs> sick. <laughs> so I have a question from uh, the audience, and this question uh, questioner's name is, um, I think it is uh, Sinbad? Simbad? Simran, sorry, Simran. And uh, mm -hmm. he or she is asking, is dark matter research the future forte for the upcoming generation of physicists and astronomers? How long will it last? And has it begun full-fledgedly? This is looking for, for dark matter specifically. Oh, interesting. Um, so I'm my research specialty isn't dark matter. And I think if you tried to map like all the exciting fields that are coming up in astronomy, we'd be here all day. <laughs> um, you can think about all the amazing stuff we're going to learn just about how stars work, which is what I do research, um, searching for exoplanets, searching for planets that could have life on them. But I think the study of dark matter has been an amazing subfield since Vera Rubin's early work. And I think some of the telescopes that we have coming online, so everything from the Rubin Observatory, which is gonna look at how the sky is changing with time, to James Webb and Nancy Roman, so these amazing infrared telescopes, they're all gonna help give us new pieces of the puzzle. Um, and there's also people that work very much on the sort of laboratory and physics side of it, trying to get at dark matter on a sort of particle level. Mm -hmm. So. I think it's definitely a really exciting future field in astronomy. I'm biased because I work on stars, but I don't think it's the most, the only exciting future field. Mm -hmm. But it's one of those w areas where the technology and the new telescopes that we're building really help shape the science that we're going to be able to do. And dark matter is in a great place for that going forward. Yeah, I'm showing on the on the um, live stream um, uh, screen share that you can't see. Uh, the image you sent me from your colleague, Julia DeCanton's uh, fat survey, was that the pan yes. chromatic? Well, what does it stand for? You tell me. <laughs> oh, um, oh, gosh, panchromatic Hubble Andromeda, Andromeda Treasury, Treasury survey, I think. Right. You know um, that she was trying to get that acronym. name. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Oh, oh, we could do a whole, I'm I'm not sure if you've done this, you could do a whole podcast on just tortured astronomical acronyms. I don't know why astronomers in particular do this. I think it's because, I think it's because to get into astronomy, you have to be a little bit of an art or creative kid, but <laughs> boy, we have some wacky acronyms. That's but right. yeah, this don't is Don't talk to me amazing... about that. I, I, I coined the term well, bicep. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Right. <laughs> but so this is this amazing multicolor survey of Andromeda. And I actually like showing it to people as a contrast between the Hubble image of Andromeda, I think on the previous slide, taken by Edwin Hubble yes. with a glass photographic plate. And this was the plate in which he conclusively determined that Andromeda was another galaxy rather than just this weird spiral shaped nebula in our own Milky Way. And then you compare that to the Hubble image that we have today. And it's just a great demonstration of the way technology has really opened up our eyes and changed what we but also how technology has very much changed how we get data. Right. Yeah, I'm comparing. Yeah, exactly. And then the future with the Vera Rubin Observatory that you combine in this uh, in this slideshow here, uh, just the uh, a massive ama amount of technology imaging. You talk about the equivalent number of Lord of the Rings DVDs you'd you'd be getting in a single day, yes. uh, a night of observing. It's just incomprehensible. I have another guest uh, who's got a name which which must be maybe it's an Irish name. I don't know. Uh, Church of Entropy. This is the name uh, that she is showing here. <laughs> Does uh, does Emily believe in singularities? So, in other words, I, I've been talking a lot about the 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 absence of really physical evidence for singularities, and that we um, we have evidence for compact objects, but there's no evidence, at least in my to my knowledge. Maybe you can correct me, uh, but of an actual infinite quantity, such as density, temperature, pressure, whatever, in the physical world, in the mathematical world, certainly it does exist. But um, do mm -hmm. you believe that that singularities can truly exist in in space and in in time? So, with the caveat that this isn't my research specialty, I do mostly because I like the, we do see an example of something infinite, we have an infinite universe. And I like the idea of an infinite universe and physics in an infinite universe basically being mathematics come to life. Now, whether one of these is common 
like garden variety and something that we see all the time and exactly how you get into the nuts and bolts of what happens to physics around something that we might call a singularity gets into a whole other topic and a topic that I can't pretend to be an expert on. But I see it as a very elegant mathematical and physical explanation of phenomena that we see when we're talking about black holes and when we're talking about these great extremes of how space-time works. So when it gets into exactly what you would call a singularity and exactly where we think the mathematics and the physics either meet in the middle or kind of pass each other a little bit. I'm not sure, but I like it very much as the clearest explanation for how compact objects, and especially black holes, how they actually work. Mm. And then getting a little bit closer to uh, to home, perhaps, you speak a lot, and I actually was not familiar with this, but speaking of of singularities and people that have worked on this, the Thorn uh, Zeitkow object. You spend a lot of time on that. It's so fascinating. What appeals to you about about this object or why should people care about such an object? I'm showing the image of it uh, on the screen right now. You can't see it, unfortunately, but talk to us about the Thorn oh, so Zeitkow. So I had to email Anna Zhitkov to make sure that I was pronouncing it right. Okay. So it's Thorn Zhitkov object. But, um, I got fascinated in these because one of my research specialties are stars known as red supergiants. So these are stars that are much more massive than our sun that um, live these very short lives and then die as a supernova. Um, and a thorn Zhitkov object is thought to look almost exactly like a red supergiant, except instead of a core that supports itself through nuclear fusion, that's a core that supports itself through quantum physics because its core is a neutron star. Um, Kip Thorne and Anna Zhitkov predicted these back in the 1970s, and for decades, they were kind of a consequence of this infinite universe idea, right? If physics says that these can exist, they either should exist or they don't because the physics is wrong. But finding them and looking for evidence of them was pretty challenging. Um, I started working on this with a colleague of mine after Anna Zhitkov emailed us saying, you know, you work on red supergiants. Have you thought about trying to search for these? They're very hard to find because you mostly need to identify them based on really weird, tiny chemical quirks. But we undertook a search for them as part of my research. And I talk about that search and what we found and how we found it in The Last Stargazers. Because to me, it's a fun comparison of how people imagine scientific discovery works. You know, like you sit at a telescope, a big red light goes off and you leap up like, Eureka, we found aliens, as opposed to how it actually wound up working out. <laughs> but I think they're fascinating because if they, if we truly have found the first one and we're still studying these stars, then it's a completely new model for how stars can work and the physics of the insides of stars. And understanding the physics of the insides of stars helps us understand supernovae. It helps us understand things like core collapse and compact objects and black holes. It helps us understand the composition of the universe, which is what Margaret Burbage worked on. So there's a lot of puzzles to pull out of something like a new way for a star to work. Yeah. And uh, some of my uh, audience uh, members are wondering about um, how you have used the multi-wavelength capabilities. Are you going to use LIGO for anything in particular, or Ice Cube, some of the instruments you talk about in the book? I actually love the idea of multi-wavelength astronomy, and it's something that's becoming more and more prevalent that instead of picking a wavelength regime on a paper that we just submitted talking about gravitational waves and the idea of using gravitational waves to study thorn Zhitkov objects. So I would love to use LIGO data at some point. Mm -hmm. I've worked a lot with optical and infrared data. With I've gotten Hubble time to use ultraviolet data. I've had research students work with X-ray data. Um, I think I've worked across pretty much the whole electromagnetic spectrum. I'd love to do more work in the radio. Um, that's a, probably my least well sampled area. But I think multi wavelength and multi messenger astronomy is just amazing. Um, a point that I try to make to readers in The Last Stargazers is that we don't, for the most part, get labs. Um, unless you're an asteroid specialist and your research very literally comes to you, um, all you have to work with is light. So the more light we can get and the more data that we can get to try and answer our questions, the closer we get to having a lab and the closer we get to having things that we can tinker with. So more wavelengths, the better. <laughs> more wavelength, more better. Exactly. Uh, so the next question I have is about these uh, peritons. Is that how you say it? These are interesting, um, yes. strange objects, which also belie in so, uh, some evidence perhaps for instrumental or systematic biases that we've, uh, that we've observed. Mm -hmm. So can you say something about that? I'm showing the scenes from, uh, from parks 
and from uh, and the slide with the microwave oven on my screen right now. Oh yes, so I I love the story of peritons because people tend to get a kick out of stories like this when you're giving a presentation or talking to people about science because I think people like to hear about scientists being tricked and I think any good scientist likes to learn lessons from cases of scientists being tricked, and this was a classic case of a telescope in Australia picking up these short blasts of radio waves, and thinking you know these could be weird bursts of radio light from deep space. What's what could possibly be causing them? We should study these, and then getting pulled up short by this idea of no, we're probably just detecting some weird terrestrial interference. Um, in the radio regime, there's all sorts of things that can cause radio interference. Um, Wi-Fi networks can cause them. Um, spark plugs in cars, in internal combustion engines, can create little blasts of radio light. So. We're completely familiar with terrestrial interference, and this team at Parks went about trying to explain ways that you could produce a blast of radio waves from something garden variety on Earth. And my favorite part of this is that they got sort of an early hint that there was a problem because they realized these things they were detecting that they nicknamed peritons. It's a mythical creature that looks like one thing but is something else. Uh, they were clustering around the lunchtime hour and space is weird but space doesn't care when lunch is in australia <laughs> so that was kind of the first clue and then they sort of fussed with microwaves trying to see well a microwave produces radio interference we know can we get a microwave to make a periton and they couldn't because they were being very good careful scientists they were placing a ceramic mug of water in a microwave they were letting it run for 10 seconds waiting opening it and then not seeing anything. And when they've started using the microwaves, like, you know, impatient, hungry people, where you let it count down and before it gets to the end, you go, and eh, screw it, eh, and open the door, then they were able to make a periton. And it explained most of the blasts of radio light that they were getting, but not all of them. Some of them were real. And today, these are a class of objects called fast radio bursts that we still don't really understand and that people are still studying. But we had to find and explain the microwaves and kind of get the microwave data out of the pile before we could study the real science of real radio bursts from space instead of from the break room. <laughs> Very good. And the next kind of question that might be allied with it or not is why are these telescopes located in specific locations? Uh, can't they be used essentially anywhere if they're, uh, if they're just looking up at the same night sky that's shared around the world? Yeah, so the location of telescopes matters a great deal because much like with the peritons, we want to make sure we're detecting things from space and nowhere else. So for the type of light that we see with our eyes, we want telescopes in very remote places. And we want to be in places where the atmosphere is very still so the air quality is nice and crisp. We want to be in places where you're getting very little light pollution, where the weather is good so that you can, you know, actually use the telescope on night to night instead of being stopped by clouds or the immense thunderstorm that we have raging here in Seattle. There's a reason we don't build telescopes in Seattle. Seattle. Um, for radio telescopes, you want them very far from radio interference. You also like to put them in places where you can get a great view of as much as the sky as possible. Um, this is why a lot, not all telescopes, but a lot of telescopes are built near the equator. Um, and then a place like the South Pole, you get access to half the sky, but you get access all the time. And you're in this wonderfully remote, dry, perfect place for observing. So where we put telescopes on Earth is actually really critically important, especially when you get into what type of um, light you want to detect. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I have a question uh, that I will use my host prerogative to ask you. You talk a lot about the book towards the end, uh, uh, and I want to share some of the uh, some of the material that you provided for book clubs and other readers, which is uh, just so helpful. Another thing uh, that you did, I wish I did in my book, uh, easy to remember name, a 2009 IP, which is a thought to be a supernova maybe it's not it was a nova and then, so it was discovered in 2009 and then you talk about it uh and its behavior in 2012 and now we are here in the end gloriously the end of 2020 hopefully it'll be coming soon without much more uh drama but who knows a supernova could go off again and that could cause more problems and Maybe that's likely, and given everything that's happened so far. But anyway, you talk about your heart sinking when another uh, group uh, sort of was was uh, horning in on your racket, so to speak. Uh, I want I want you to talk about that. What does it feel like? How 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 does competition drive? Uh, discoveries in astronomy. We, you talk about even people hacking, you know, the Hubble uh, Twitter account to see what people are looking at to gain an unfair advantage. Talk about uh, competition in astronomy and then personalize it and how it felt to you when you were potentially scooped and, and, and how that felt. 
I, I think that healthy competition in science is excellent. I think it helps keep people honest. Um, I think that having multiple people working on a problem and taking their own approach can only make the eventual answer to the problem better. Um, but this is another case where we don't want to forget that scientists are people and scientists are human. And when you imagine making a great discovery, nobody imagines making the great discovery second. You kind of want to be first. And the trick is that balancing act between doing the work first and doing the work well. And where I get disappointed a lot of times in science, and I think we, st we still see it happening, is the rush to be first can sometimes lead to sloppy science or rushed science. And this is where I think it's great that there's multiple teams working because we can catch each other's mistakes. I've absolutely had people catch mistakes that I've made in my research and been glad. Um, I talked about those thorn Jitgov objects uh, that we were studying before, and there's been multiple papers saying, you know, maybe you didn't find a thorn Jitgov object. Maybe you were wrong. Maybe you made a mistake. And I want those people to keep writing those papers because if we were wrong, we should know and we'd like to find out what we actually found. And if we were right, then we need to try and poke at the discovery as much as possible and make sure that we're certain. So philosophically, you want there to be, like you want competition and you want people to strive for better science. Um, there is the disappointment of like, oh, could I have worked a little harder? Could I have been a little more careful? Could I have done this work first if I'd just been a little better at this or if I'd been a little faster. Um, and I do remember the disappointment of seeing another team doing what looked like the exact same work that we were doing when we'd had no idea that it was happening because you've worked so hard on something and then you see it sort of scooped out from under you. This is the term scooping. But I think that it's an interesting line to draw. And this comes up a few times in the book that there's a line between competition that makes us all better at what we do in competition that ends with people sniping at one another with research that really gets rushed out and kind of thrown into the press before it's ready or research that gets um, sort of done in the service of being first rather than in the service of being right. Um, there was this massive scramble the first time we detected both gravitational waves and electromagnetic radiation from an object that I think ended in wonderfully careful scientific papers, but like the political tale of how that happened is practically a book on its own. So I think when people say, oh, you you need to like totally remove like interpersonal politics from science, again, you can't because science is done by people and you have to keep in mind what drives someone and whether it's like pure scientific curiosity or also a little bit of like, now I get to be in the news and <laughs> recognizing that I think is important when we understand why we do what we do. Absolutely. I, I look at your work and uh, I am mostly jealous of only one thing, which is that uh, Sophia observation. So I'm showing Sophia. I've been showing Sophia in the yes. back. So I'm a pilot, uh, a private pilot. I don't work for the airlines yet. Uh, but uh, but I love airplanes. I love flying. And I'm an astronomer. So what better place for me to do it? And one of, one of my uh, friends, uh, uh, who's a professor here, um, Karen Sandstrom, and, and others have used, of course, used Sophia and flown on it. I'm like, can I be your graduate student, uh, please, Karen? Uh, but but anyway, um, so what what is it like? What are these uh, besides the majestic image of a plane flying with a giant hole in its side? Uh, what what <laughs> what kind of impact do instruments like that have on the work that you do? I um so I first learned about Sophia thanks to Jim Elliott, and then years later when I was getting ready to write this book, realized that I wanted to learn more about what it was like to use it, and I came at it from a sort of just experience perspective, I actually wound up using Sophia for my research because this gets back to a question that another one of your listeners asked, which was how do you use multi-wavelength observations? There's data that we can only get right now by flying up above most of the water vapor in our atmosphere and working from the stratosphere. And there are wavelengths that Sophia is uniquely capable of getting. And we won't really have that capability until James Webb launches in 20. <laughs> um, but, so until then, I think Sophia fills an important sort of role in our research and being able to access wavelengths like that and take the data that Sophia is capable of is great because it gives us another piece of the puzzle. And you get to fly on a plane into the stratosphere. Like how, how fun can it get? So I, I loved my chance to learn about Sophia and talk to the crew members and then fly on it. And it's one of my favorite experiences that I wrote about in the book. Yeah, 
I could you not? It's such a it's such a phenomenal instrument, and you know who knows? Maybe uh, maybe you'll take me on as I get my second PhD someday. Um, I want to wind down with some of the uh, random questions, but also uh, kind of uh, uh, go a little bit lower tech and uh, and sort of how you start off the uh, the book is is sort of this um, this homage to a naked eye observing. And it reminds me of a question. One of my listeners, who's actually an author and naturalist, his name's Bernie Taylor, and he has a theory that women were the first astronomers because uh, of their monthly cycles, so to speak, that they would notice correlations, maybe uh, you know, confusing them or saying, con con you know, confirming them as a sort of uh, responsible or connected to some way the astronomical periods of the moon and, and other daily phenomena. I don't know if you've ever heard this. Uh, you know, you talk about the last stargazers, but maybe women were the first stargazers, according to him. I don't. So I'm hesitant of getting too far into anything that could look like, you know, evolutionary psychology. Yeah, no, but I do. But I do think that the idea of naked eye astronomy stretching far back, much further back than I think people imagine is an important thing to keep in mind, because I think a lot of people think about the first astronomer and they think of like Galileo and, you know, like the outfit with the little um, telescope on the balcony pointing it up at something. And the history of astronomy goes back so much further than that. And if you just look at, for example, things like indigenous astronomy and the sort of storytelling aspect of how we studied the night sky and how we passed down what we knew about the night sky, like this is such a fascinating detail of how we studied the way that the night sky changed with time and how we used it to do everything from, you know, keep track of the seasons, keep track of when things grew. Um, navigation was an immense part of it. Like if you wanna look at some of the most astonishing astronomers in history, you can look at um, Polynesian navigators and the like petrifyingly enormous trips that they were able to take through an area as hostile as the Pacific Ocean just by knowing the sky by heart. Um, so when I think back to the first astronomers, I think of things like this. Um, there's a really cool detail of astronomy that didn't actually make it into the last stargazers, but that I love because when you think about um, early astronomy, you maybe think of it in terms of storytelling and mythology and just, oh, look at the pretty stars and we made shapes in them. And the early observers were actually discovering really interesting things about the night sky. So Aboriginal astronomers had identified um, Eta Carina and its variability in the 1800s. They'd recognized for a very long time that Betelgeuse is a variable. Um, we've been studying the weird variability of Betelgeuse very recently, but Aboriginal astronomers knew about this long, long before we had things like light curves and computer data and like, you know, digital data on these stars. So when I think of the first astronomers, I like thinking back to sort of the full breadth of knowledge that we can get on astronomy and really think about what we can gain from all these different areas. Yeah. And I'm showing here, of course, a naked eye observation that was made of the of the moon going in front of another astronomical object, the sun, uh, that you lead off the, the book with and your adventures as a professional astronomer witnessing an event in 2017 and what that meant to you and kind of how you lost your mind, uh, as did I, witnessing the exact same event a few hours later in South Carolina. Talk us uh, through that, and then we'll close with a couple more questions from the audience. And uh, and I would really very much like to hear uh, how the uh, eclipse of 2017 uh, impacted you as a professional and just as a person. Oh, I loved it. I, I'd wanted to see a total eclipse for years, but I'd just never gotten the chance to go. Um, one thing I loved about it is that I got to see it with my whole family and with a bunch of colleagues because we all went out to uh, Wyoming to see this total eclipse. Um, I'd heard all these descriptions about how beautiful it was and this like peaceful moment of like feeling the moon and the earth and the sun align and how lovely it would be. And I, once we hit totality, I just went, ah, like, there's so much to see. There's so much to do. This is so cool. Like I don't, I don't have a lot of chill and none of it was on evidence during the, uh, during the total eclipse, but it was so memorable to me to watch the lead up to it and see, I was in a giant field on a golf course with a bunch of amateur astronomers and watch how many people were getting sucked in by an astronomical event. Um, during the total eclipse itself, I was so excited to see things like the solar corona because I researched the outer layers of stars and stellar winds. And I was looking at it with my eyes. Like I wasn't looking at data from it or a spectrum of it or observations through a telescope. Like I was staring at a phenomenon that I study, mm -hmm. which I just thought was so cool. And I loved seeing how it hit the news. I loved that for a day or two, astronomy was getting people excited 
all over the country. Um, it's actually something that I think about now in the context of The Last Stargazers and in the context of the book coming out <laughs> in the middle of the pandemic, because people will ask, you know, why does astronomy matter? Why do we care? What does it really give to us? And we've seen the power of a shared experience at unifying people through something like the pandemic, which is sadly pretty tragic and a really difficult time for a lot of people. But you see the shared experience of people all over the planet going through this together. And astronomy to me gives people that same global scale shared experience, but through joy. So something like sharing the experience of looking at a solar eclipse or observing that naked eye comet that came by back in July um, or seeing the first picture that we took of a black hole or hearing about potentially habitable planets. Like these are some these are things that we can share as humans. And I think getting a little reminder of there's a shared human experience, regardless of what else we might be going through. And sometimes it can be something sad like a pandemic. Sometimes it can be something happy, like a reminder of how the universe works and that to me is really something that I think astronomy adds and contributes to humanity. And then speaking of the moon and speaking of uh, your uh, your kind of enviable position of being able to do many different things in astronomy, uh, the, again, another question is, if an observatory is built on the moon, would Professor Levesque want to be the first person to be, take a trip there on the maiden voyage to the moon <laughs> observatory? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, yes. But a cool, just a cool fact, and like, again, I can't stop myself from doing this with the like, did you know? But something I write about in the book is that we actually have put an observatory on the moon before, and I'm amazed that more people don't know about this. Um, we sent an ultraviolet telescope to the moon on board Apollo 16, built by um, this amazing astronomer and engineer named George Carruthers. Um, he's actually the guy that invented basically the ultraviolet camera and the ability to capture UV images. And he built that and put it into this little like three inch telescope that was used on Apollo 16 by John Young and Charlie Duke. So I love the idea of a permanent observatory on the moon with, you know, the heaps of funding that we will surely have for scientific research and space exploration. Um, but I like pointing back to that first example of space-based and moon-based astronomy and saying, well, we need to do more of that because we did it before and it was really fascinating. So I would love to go back. <laughs> and then Lisa Locke, a friend of mine and yours potentially, she asked, do you have any information on why the infrared telescope Spica was canceled? Spica. Um, I don't, unfortunately. So Spica was the space infrared telescope for cosmology and astrophysics. Um, my understanding is it's still – oh, it recently got canceled yes. as um, a candidate for a ESA mission. So I unfortunately wasn't involved with the project and can't say a lot about why it was canceled. Um, I know that we'll have some really excellent infrared space telescopes already planned between James Webb and the Roman Space Telescope. Um, I'm always of the mind that the more telescopes we can put up, the better. But I also know that hard decisions need to be made between multiple different types of observatories. So hopefully there will be more coming out from the folks who made that decision about why it happened. Because I know it was canceled pretty recently, right? Yeah. Like in the past week or two. That's right. Yeah. Well, um, hopefully we'll learn more. Emily, yeah. uh, I want to thank you so much. Uh, our guest has been uh, Professor Dr. Emily Levesque of the University of Washington Astronomy Department author of a phenomenal book, The Last Stargazers. I'm going to be posting my review. I listened to the audiobook. I read the hardcover. Uh, I downloaded the Kindle, so I've got all formats. It's beautifully uh, bound, published. Your publisher should uh, receive a lot of credit for such a wonderful book. Of course, your agent or co-editor, help, helping it, help, assistant editor Jeff Shreve, our mutual friend, uh, deserves some credit, and you thank him in the acknowledgments. There's a guide for readers groups and discussion groups in the back of the book. I'm putting a link to Emily's uh, lovely TEDx talk from uh, earlier this year uh, at Given at Berkeley, and other resources will be in the show notes that will be forthcoming. I want to thank you so much, Emily, for your time on this uh, rainy, thundery weather, at least far up north uh, from where I sit. Thank you so much for having me. Great pleasure. Take care. Bye.